And let's say a person has a, the ability to make money. I know a guy who, he, he's like a money magnet. Everything he does turns to gold. It's a talent. It's a gift. So I pondered this a lot. What Jesus talks about the fruit. He says he's the vine, we're the branches, we abide in him, we bear much fruit. But he didn't tell us that fruit was personal piety. He just talked about fruit. And then there are different passages in the Bible about fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. You think of a project or an investment bearing fruit. You think of a fruitful life. This term is very well used. But I pondered this. And in the context of the Middle East, when a, there's a lot of, there are a lot of vineyards in the Middle East, the Mediterranean area. And if a vine isn't pruned properly, it won't bear fruit properly. If it's not tended properly, it won't bear fruit. But if it has, if it's, well-rooted in good soil, it has enough water, it has sunshine, it's pruned properly, it's like a life being prepared, having the right values of being rooted, it bears fruit. But the question that people who make a bunch of money building the equity in a company and never sharing that with the people who helped them build it is, what entitlement do we have to the fruit of our own labor? We, we're we not supposed to muzzle the ox while it treads the grain. We're supposed to pay people their just, their just pay. We're supposed to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. We're supposed to be generous. We're supposed to work hard so that we don't create a burden for others. There are all kinds of good things, right? But then there's this disturbing parable that Jesus gave of the guy who was very wealthy. He had lots of fields and he made, he, he had great harvests and lots of grain. And he one night said to himself, Elf, you've done very well. You should build bigger barns to store all this abundance. And Jesus tells the people listening to the parable, this man didn't know that he was going to die that night. He would be answerable. What he should have done, this is a re surprise then, Jesus says, what he should have done is sell the grain. And people don't think about what some of these parables say. They're, they're puzzling, they're confusing to the traditional thinking. We don't like to quote Jesus, we like to quote the Apostle Paul, we like to quote church custom. But Jesus is not fun to quote because he says things that if you think about it, they're disturbing. For the person who is socialist-minded, that's not very good of a thing to hear. If you sell the grain, you make a bunch of money. To the capitalist, it's not fun to hear that because you can't, if you're going to just sell your grain at the spot prices, you can't corner the market. You can't hoard it to raise prices. You can't play the futures market. You can't get into speculation. You just sell it. If the grain comes in, you sell it. What are you doing? You're, you're actually contributing to a local economy. You're allowing people to buy it at whatever price the market demands. In other words, you can't control it. You still make money, but the people get to use it then. They can start a bakery. They can feed their families. So back to fruit. The profound question that I kept coming up year after year in my life is, what is the fruit it is not for the consumption by the vine. The vi a grapevine doesn't eat its own grapes. It's, the fruit is there for someone else, something else. It reproduces the vine and provides fruit and food for birds and animals and people. And they, can, they make wine and they sell grapes. And they do like I do. I eat raisins and I freeze grapes. I don't, I'm not content to eat just a plain grape. But the point is, the vine doesn't need its own fruit. How does that apply to me? If, if I have, if, if one of the fruits of my life is I have the ability to make a billion dollars, am I entitled to just consume that billion dollars? Build mansion after mansion, build a yacht, fly the best, eat the best, live the best, 
disassociate from people who smell bad, not give away? If I have a sense of noblesse oblige, do I wait 50 years until, oh no, I'm going to die now. I'm going to leave this money to build a wing of a hospital or I'm going to do something in, in philanthropy that will give me a name. Why didn't I do that 50 years ago or 30 years ago? Why did I hoard that in order to do something later? Why didn't I just let it go at the time? I would have still prospered. But a lot of the problems, and this kind of brings up some of my evolution of thinking regarding uh, philanthropy and regarding nonprofits. They're often built to solve problems that if people were more generous and shared the wealth with their workers, and instead of hoarding that equity value, if they would let it continue on to bless the community generation after generation, then you wouldn't have some of the poverty that nonprofits are funded by billionaires later to solve. Make, make yeah. jobs now. So in this, when you and I met, that became one of the themes. So here we have ideas of what do you do with the work you do and do you eat your own fruit or is it there for others and you? And what happens when you accumulate generationally linked to, until the dynasty is grown? And then what happens with philanthropy? One author says it's the last bastion of colonialism is philanthropy. There's truth in that. 